the fact that we're a company that's thinking about these issues and making sure that ultimately the health of our users is the most important thing to us is something we stand by. And I hope that everyone developing AI thinks that same way, but there's a chance that it won't happen. And then people, users have to vote with their attention and their time and their money on, on which company they want to support. So Nick, the, the thing that, that I love about your experience, and I want to see if you can help us understand it. You went to school to study engineering, and now you are a co-founder of a software company. So like, help me understand, how did this happen? Yeah, it's a, it's a question I actually get often from people because they see my path. It feels like I've switched careers maybe three times since since actually graduating college, and it's only been about nine or 10 years. I mean, if we're being real honest, I was, I think I was searching for something in work. I graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Michigan, moved down to Houston. My first job was working for Shell Oil. It was really cool for one week out of the year. We'd go offshore on boats in the Gulf of Mexico and install equipment with remote controlled submarines and cranes and thousands of feet of water. As a kid, if you told me I was gonna be doing that, I would have thought it was the coolest job. The downside was the 51 other weeks of the year weren't super exciting in the office. And she was like a great company, but I saw you know people who worked there their whole careers, 40 year careers. And I just saw that and it didn't feel like what I wanted to do for the next 40 years. I just started exploring. I'd always been curious about startups and entrepreneurship and thought the Elon Musk, the Jeff Bezos is Steve Jobs. Those were really cool. Houston has a startup scene. It's nothing like Silicon Valley, but enough where I could start to get involved and just learn because I had no idea what it took to, to start a business. I maybe ran a, a lemonade stand as a kid once or sold some things on Craigslist, but I wasn't the kid that had candy shops out of their locker in, in grade school. You hear some entrepreneurs have that story. That wasn't me. So I had to learn what business was what it took to start a company. I would work with different startups and would fall into like a marketing and advertising type role. That was partially just because what I was able to learn on the internet. I've learned so much from YouTube. I feel like I've learned multiple degrees worth of information from YouTube. And that's where I learned how to run paid Facebook and Instagram ads for companies to get them new customers. I ended up quitting Shell and thought that I was gonna build this marketing agency, make it wildly successful, and then, and then who knows from there. But that was my plan. I quit, signed a few clients, and almost immediately, was not interested in signing any more clients. Looking back, I think it was more of like an ego type decision to quit. You just hear different things from childhood, like you're gonna start a company one day, I see you be on Shark Tank. And I had these like expectations of myself. And I looked at the new grad working at Shell and it didn't seem to align with what I thought my path was supposed to be. And there was like that disconnect inside of me and it made me really anxious. And that's why I kind of like push myself to try and start my own thing. But once I proved that I could start a business and sign clients on my own, the drive to do it any longer almost totally evaporated. And I knew this was not gonna work out when I would start to go into sales deals that I knew I could close, but like not close them because I didn't want to actually execute the services. Cause I was selling, then running the ads for people. I kind of hated running the ads for businesses that maybe I didn't care a whole lot about their product or what they were doing. Yeah, that all led to me shutting it down. And then I had no idea what to do next. And so I ended up moving back to Virginia in with my parents. And like I said, had no idea what to do. Felt like I didn't want to go get an, another nine to five job. And I just sat there. I remember sitting there the first night I was back thinking, what am I going to do? And my dad had always had guitars. I tried to play. I think I like picked it up when I was a kid once and tried to learn a Red Hot Chili Peppers song. Turns out it's like one of the hardest songs to play on guitar. So I gave up after, I don't know, a few hours of trying and then never touched the guitar. But I was sitting in my parents' basement on the couch that I've sat on thousands of times and looked over in the corner and saw the guitars and just said, I'm going to learn how to play the guitar. I spent the next basically year, my routine, Monday through Friday, and most of the weekends was I'd wake up, I'd eat breakfast, I'd play guitar and learn how to sing for a few hours. I'd go to the gym, come back, eat lunch, play guitar and learn how to sing and produce, learning all this, kind of like all the tech involved with microphones and things on the computer to record the things I was making, which weren't great at the beginning, I'll admit, but they've gotten better. It was just a year where I could kind of just decompress and scratch a creative itch. And it was really fun. One of the most fun years I had, kind of my, I'll call it my gap year because I didn't take one after the end of college. And I wasn't 
a good enough musician to make money from it. So I had to, had to get a job or making some money. The learning that I had from running that marketing business was I actually enjoyed the process of selling. And this almost comes full circle to Eugene. My first experience in quote unquote professional selling was an internship I had as a sophomore in college selling Aflac insurance. I knew I enjoyed the selling motion we're going to like nerd out for lack of a better term from that internship. I enjoyed it again when I was working my marketing business, but I didn't enjoy the service execution. My theory was, Hey, can I get a job? that's just selling and a proprietary product. The one thing I learned as well with the marketing business is I was running paid Facebook and Instagram ads for businesses and anyone can go and run those ads. Even the, the business owner, you're really kind of just competing on the brand or the relationship you make with someone. Goal is to find a software sales job with a proprietary product and just learn that space. And again, kind of start to scratch my itch on tech startups. Did that for three or four years at three different companies moving earlier and earlier stage. So the first company I joined was a company of about 500 selling software to government. Worked there a couple of years, did pretty well. Not many people are as introspective as you are. A lot of people are just interested in the outcome not necessarily the journey or the process. Have you always been like that where you're like, okay, I want to do something, but I want it to have a why or a meaning for me? I'm maybe too interested in true reality, like the reality of this situation. It probably comes from my engineering brain. I've always been good at math and science. I don't think engineering was a bad major to pick. Just didn't love the work afterwards. But my brain kind of just works in that way. It's very analytical. It likes data. It likes to solve problems from from what I know to be true um, and not like blurry information. You opened a can of worms. You, you mentioned that you did an internship with Aflac and that internship was with me. So you brought it up and we spent the summer together when, how old were you at the time? Like 21? 20, 21, I think 20. We had a big group and a few of you guys were superstars, man. And you were like, you were like locked in. Can you tell a little bit about how that internship helped you? Because of course, Aflac was a big brand. It, it is a big brand, but you know, it's not easy to get out there and sell insurance to businesses or the concept to businesses for their employees. So how is that experience helping you today? How did it help you as a 20 year old? I remember the office quite vividly actually which is interesting and i remember being given this sheet their printout sheets and they had maybe a hundred different contacts and there was a contacts of the business owner their address and their phone number and our job was just to cold call these businesses and see if we could set up an appointment with the business owner or a high level decision maker and see if they're interested in in bringing aflac in for their employees i don't know where it came from but I was afraid to call people on the phone. That summer, I made, I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of phone calls and got over that fear of calling people. And I definitely had people answer the phone and tell me to lose their number and never call back as, as happens in cold calling sometimes. But I think it just, it gave me my first taste of almost all sides of selling. So that rejection side, getting a bunch of no's, but still going in and showing up. But then also, I was able to go on some deals that other people had closed, such as Eugene or Sarah, and was able to actually get in front of customers and sell to someone face to face in a way of positioning something that could really help them out. That's where I actually started to like enjoy selling. I feel like selling sometimes gets a bad rap because used car salesmen, it's like they're trying to trick you into parting with your money for some piece of crap car that's going to fall apart in two miles. But when you think of like real, true professional sales is, can I understand someone's problems and then present a solution for them that they feel like parting with their money, the solution they're getting is 10 times more valuable. That right there is a powerful statement, Nick, because many people can't get over that hump. You said it best is because they never come to the realization that the exchange that they are proposing is going to benefit the customer 10 times more than the money they're parting with. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's like, I've sold a bunch of different products. It's way more fun when you talk to someone and you really understand their problem and you know that what you have is going to make their life 10 times easier or 
it's really going to help them in a certain way when that's the truth and you really care about the product. And this maybe is a segue into a Alomia. Selling something you really care about, it just makes the process so easy. And it's, it's about, if we're going to get nerdy into sales again, transferring that conviction. I love to hear your generation, Nick, talk about these things because my generation, which is older than your generation, we gotta, we have to admit that you guys are bringing in some new energy and a lot of new mindsets and concepts. How would you sum up your sales mindset in your own words? You, you've given us a good overview, but like your generation, which you're like right there at the cusp of millennial and Gen Z, that's a really key generation in today's sales development. What is sales to you? You said transferring that confidence. Could you put it any other way that you think differentiates it from the old sales concept of previous generations? I call it giving someone the menu of the services or products or things I have to offer. I push to make sure that I understand their problems and they understand which solutions, if any, can solve their problems. I push to make sure that that becomes clear to both sides. But once that happens, once it's clear, I personally don't push a whole lot in trying to make a sale. I like to give the menu, explain which of these dishes or products they're going to enjoy the most, and then let them decide whether to buy or not. Potentially money gets left on the table, but potentially that's a more enjoyable experience for the buyer. And they buy more or they buy more quickly, or once they buy, they're so happy with the experience they've had with me, they're excited to recommend me and what I sell and my company to other people. This leads to the thing that you care about so much. And we want to hear about Alomia from the co-founder's perspective. What is it? Some people are already tuning in, knowing what it is and knowing, hey, we're talking to the co-founder, but like for those who are just now meeting you, what is Alomia? I'm going to take a step back and touch on why Alomia exists. We talked about the few software sales jobs I had going earlier and earlier stage. Just wanted to learn what it was like to work at a smaller company. The last company I worked for, I was employee number seven, managing all the sales. It was a cool opportunity. Ended up not working out and I got laid off. This was about the time I was getting deeper into my mental health journey and learning how my mind works, how my brain works what different patterns I have, what are useful. Again, similar time that ChatGPT from OpenAI was coming out and everyone was checking that out, seeing how it worked. My mind went to, I think AI can do some of this type of work and help people out. So I downloaded every mental health powered by AI app I could find and tested all of them and wanted to see like, where is AI crossed with mental health? Like where is this the status of the technology 2023? I had a conversation with one that I thought was way more impressive than AI should have been at the time. And that was Alomia. The founder would just send an automated email to all the iOS app users just asking for feedback. And I responded thoughtfully. And we started going back and forth. I was asking questions, telling them what I've been working on. And this was about the time they were trying to switch into a B2B software sales type model. So I started taking on different work and and it's turned into the relationship I have now, full-time co-founder role at Alomia. So the why is people are going through things and you also never know what people are going through. Some people have the means to access therapy or they have relationships in their life that they can turn to to talk through things they're going through and get advice and work through challenges. But there's a lot of people that don't. There's a lot of people that don't have those relationships, those friendships those family relationships, don't have the means to afford a therapist, don't have access. Maybe there's just none in their area or in their country. Why is Alomia a great option? Because there's companies that do similar things. How do you make the distinction in your mind? Yeah, there are. And, and even to an in individual, I would recommend download them all and try, you know, figure out which one works the best for you. I think we're in this because we want to see people get more healthy. Finding the best solution for you that you think is the best fit is going to be the way you get the most healthy. So try everything if you can. The way that the Lomia differentiates itself right now, say from something like a chat GPT, is on two fronts. One, it's designed to be a conversation that's going to improve your mental health. Our head of clinical is a PhD in psychology. Our team of clinicians has designed the conversation to one, help you understand what you're going through, ask you questions to do so, and position a technique or an exercise based on common therapy principles to get you to a better mental state. And again, this can be if you're 
if you're going through something that's more serious like depression or anxiety or if you just want to problem solve a relationship you have at work or in your personal life or just get advice on you know what career you want to pick or, or where you should explore so it's very general purpose again in a similar way that the different large language models are but designed to be helpful and um, safe as well everyone's heard of ai going off the rails, hallucinating, saying things wrong. And we've put a lot of checks in place to make sure that the advice and the guidance and where the conversation goes stays in a very healthy and safe place for the individual. I would say another differentiator as well is the fact that we really care about the effectiveness of our tool. And it's something that we wish people would ask us about more but we use widely accepted measurement tools in the space of therapy, such as the GAD7 and the PHQ-9, which are questionnaires that psychologists will use to check the levels of depression and anxiety in their patients. And then over time, continuing to evaluate those questionnaires, they can see where the trends are. their patients improving over time? Are their symptoms getting worse over time? And we use those same measures with our users to show that talking with Alomia is actually helping the user. We believe we're set apart because that is one of the most important, if not the most important thing to us as a company is actually getting positive outcomes for our users. Very, very important. I am so proud that Alomia has taken those things into account. How much of this is due to the fact that we are now in a environment where many people have access to high-speed internet. I mean, is this kind of like a perfect storm that Alomia can function right now, whereas maybe a few years ago, it, it wouldn't have been possible. And a few years from now, it's going to be like 10 times better. Are we in just the perfect storm of technology, internet availability? What is, what's going on that's making this the time? It's a fun question because the team's actually been researching this since, since 2019. This is way before ChatGPT came out and AI was kind of known as something that you could have a conversation with, like a text conversation. The models that they had back then were very basic chatbots. We said it was a chatbot. Some didn't believe it. Some thought it had to be a human, but other people knew it was a chatbot and didn't want to kind of converse with it for that reason. So the advancements in AI that have come up have made this more possible. And when a new technology comes out like this that could be applied to just about anything, the world is going to try all those solutions. And then the ones that actually work, they're going to stick. What it's good at is long conversations. And when you think of a context like mental health, you know, a lot of the work that's done is conversation based. To your point, it's a technology that matches up well with current processes, current techniques for working on people's mental health. So I think it is timely and, and it will get better. It's improving so fast. That's beautiful. There's many benefits. There's also risks as well. And again, another thing I'm really proud of with the team and with Alomia is the fact that we're thinking about the risks, we're trying to anticipate the risks. We talked about how you could have a very long conversation in its best form. It could help you do amazing things and learn things. In its worst form, it could be so enjoyable that it's more addictive than social media and you never wanna stop having a conversation with the AI. The fact that we're a company that's thinking about these issues and making sure that ultimately the health of our users is the most important thing to us is something we stand by. And I hope that everyone developing AI thinks that same way, but there's a chance that it won't happen. And then people, users have to vote with their attention and their time and their money on, on which company they want to support. Thinking from the viewpoint of individuals who are trained therapists, who have invested a lot of time, energy, money in their careers because they are trying to help, should they view Alomia as a threat? Our goal is not to replace therapists. Going back to the reason why Alomia exists, there's so many people that will never get access to a therapist. Our goal is to build something and work with those people to give them something slightly better than the resources they have currently. So we're more than happy to work with therapists. We have th some therapists that are interested in, in giving Alomia to their patients so they can use something in between sessions. We can then summarize those sessions and or provide transcripts to the therapist to help inform 
the maybe one hour that they have with their patients a week, AI and therapy, therapist, psychologist could work together to potentially help more patients and or make the whole experience better and more effective. And, you know, that led me to a question someone had recently for me when I was talking about Alomia. They're like, what happens to my conversations? They want to know about how secure, how encrypted. What's your answer to that? Yeah, data privacy is a huge deal, especially the fact that it's considered health data. So HIPAA rules and regulations get involved. And also sometimes people say things that they're not comfortable even telling humans, or it's the most kind of intimate pieces of knowledge about someone. And so keeping that data private and safe is something really important to us as well. All the data is owned by the individual user it's stored on their device. So they can delete it at any time. At some points, we will pull data to our servers to help train new models. If we do that, it's totally de-identified from phone number, email, any identifying demographic characteristics that we have on that user. Again, that allows us to make sure that it's safe. In addition to that, if we use any models through OpenAI or any other vendor, they're not allowed to train on the data that we give it as well. So the data stays to the individual and then to Alomi as an organization. Very, very nice answer. I like that. I think it's necessary. I've seen so many people suffer in silence and, you know, I'm a big advocate for workplace anti-bullying and things like that. I see, I see some really challenging circumstances that people endure, especially people who don't really feel accustomed to some of the bad treatment they get. And I'm so glad that Alomia is out there because I see it as a really big help. This is great. It's great to be talking to you. I, I think Alomia has a great future. I'm so glad that you are in the saddle with them. I think um, your experiences bring a lot to the company. Where do you see yourself where do you see Alomia five years from now? Right now, what our models are good at is asking questions to understand what the user is going through and then positioning a technique or an exercise for them to work through. This then enables a user to, again, feel a little better in the moment and then also be upskilled. You know, they run into the same issue in the future. They might be able to work through it faster or better or easier. That's great. But I think some advancements we want to make is around long-term memory and reasoning capabilities. And this is also something that the field of AI is thinking about as well. When you think about long-term memory, computers can store lots and lots of data. It's not about storing the data that's an issue. It's about the reasoning aspect. So if you store everything from the childhood of a user to their favorite color, to the relationships that they have in their life currently, you can store all that that they've talked about in the last few months. But without a really good reasoning engine, it's how do you know when to bring up their childhood versus their relationships versus the current work that they're doing to make sense for the conversation or the issue that the user is bringing up in real time. So that's one that we're thinking about, cutting edge for AI and definitely AI and mental health, adding voice capabilities as well as something that we want to roll out. Maybe some users still like the text and we, we keep that as well. Video, again, we're talking five years down the road, video starts to be possible. And again, all these improvements are, are they actually becoming useful for our users or are they not? And we're only following that as a god. And if we talk really far down the future, just a little fun tidbit of people to think about. When we've seen AI go into different realms, specifically games like AlphaGo and Dota, we see the AI almost create new strategies that human players didn't expect. If we think about AI in the best case, if designed properly, could AI come up with therapeutic techniques that are more effective, that help users in a different way that we haven't thought of as humans in the field? of psychology. That's unclear if it's totally possible, but I think that would be a great future to strive for as a company at Alomia. And you know, it blew my mind as you and I have talked about before that Alomia can speak fluent Spanish. What is that all about? These models are trained mostly on text data. The world has lots of text data in just about every language you can think of. When it can understand one language, it can understand many languages. And amazing. And so I'd like you to kind of wrap up your understanding or your explanation of Lomia by talking about that business client, because your role is to further strengthen those business to business relationships. What does Lomia do for a business who is given the opportunity to add Lomia? I can talk about it from the people side, but I can also talk about it from the, the business side and the productivity side. Almost 40% 
of people are going through some kind of mental health challenge. And they might not even call it a mental health challenge, but something that they're working through, something behind the scenes. Sometimes the people around them know. Sometimes, like you mentioned, they're suffering in silence. If you think about a business and an employer, if there is a desire to do right by the humans that help keep your business alive, being able to provide mental health support for them when they need it and whether you know they need it or not is a great thing to do. A lot of businesses, a lot of employers have EAPs, employee assistance programs, which connect their employees with therapists, but sometimes they can't find a provider or it might take months to get in front of someone. We actually had one client come to us because one of their employees' wives had a miscarriage and their EAP said it was going to take them six weeks to get in front of a therapist. And that's just way too long when you're going through something that tragic and that immediate. The owner of the business brought in Alomia so that employee could talk to something 24 seven immediately. If you want to make the business case, when employees can be more focused at work, when they're less stressed, when they can work through these issues in a timely manner, because they can get the support, it's going to create a much more enjoyable workplace for them and then for everyone around them. And ultimately that should impact the bottom line positively. And, you know, I've, I've talked with two major employers in the United States recently and talking to them about Alomia and with the EAPs, the employee assistance, employee assistance programs, both these employers, HR departments said that they have the EAPs available, but many of the employees do not use them or are hesitant to use them. Do you have any information on that? It's a great point. Even use an EAP, you do have to admit to another human being that you need help. And sometimes that is too much. Men especially, I feel like, have a hard time admitting that they're struggling with their mental health or they need help. We hear it from our users. They'll, they'll message us and say, I can tell them you about things that I would never tell my therapist or another human about. The fact that people know it's an AI, they know it's a computer, they know it, they can potentially tell all their deepest secrets and no one will see it's fully anonymous. That allows people to feel comfortable actually seeking out support and help. It could be someone's first experience with mental health support and talking about things with Lomia could then maybe open them up to being comfortable talking to a therapist or talking to the the humans in their life about what they're going through. I love that information because I know you're exactly right. So Lomia is a really good gateway. I like that word that you use because it's a first step. Lomia might turn into a verb like FedEx. There you go. That's the goal. Talk to Lomia if you're going through something. So now circling back to Nick Manzik, now on this journey of self-discovery where are you now this journey that you took us on is really interesting what's nick manzik mindset now it's a great question i think it changes here and there as we're all humans we're learning different things the journey is always different i think i've gotten to a place where i'm at right now is i'm really enjoying the routine i have which allows me to again work on alomia solve different problems there's constant challenges it is a startup where five or six employees full-time right now. So we're still grinding and figuring things out. So that keeps me entertained. But then I also have other hobbies and interests that I get to find some time to work through, like love to surf. Out here, I live in, in Venice in Southern California, and I love to play beach volleyball, and I love to snowboard, love to play guitar still and sing. So that's a hobby that's stuck since my, my nice year in my parents' basement. I've found a rhythm where I just enjoy improving little pieces and learning little things here and there right now it feels very sustainable again you've heard the the journey it's taken a little bit to get here and i've tried a bunch of different things it wouldn't have gone any other way i had to to see what i like see what i didn't like all the little things that i've tried they all have taught me pieces and skills that i apply to what i do now and i'm sure i'll apply in the future like right now i'm talking on a mic that i use to record music and hopefully the auto quality is a little bit better than if I didn't have this mic and I was just talking on a laptop. So it's everything just kind of comes full circle eventually if you're around long enough. I like that as a way to conclude because so many people, they think that, hey, I got to have it figured out right now. So what, what would you tell those people? What do you tell them? If you have that feeling that where you are is not where you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to be doing, listen to the feeling. Even if it's very uncomfortable, even if it means quitting a stable job, because I think, and what I've seen, at least in my life, is that staying there with that feeling of wondering what if, or wondering what could have been, is gonna be way more painful 
than the pain of, of trying something different. The adventures that you will find from doing that are gonna be well worth any discomfort.